Keller Anniversary event at DeVry University. We welcome you and we are very excited to share this celebration of some of our student awards and a faculty award. And um, to begin tonight's event, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Chris Grievison will provide a welcome address and followed by um, Dean Joe Kanopka, Dean of Academic Affairs, uh, followed by um, Professor uh, Faulkner will present our distinguished guest speaker, Mr. Frank Wyckoff. Mr. Frank Wyckoff is not a stranger to DeVry University and especially to the Keller Graduate School of Management students. He has spent uh, many hours mentoring our students and uh, providing some, some great industry insight into um, their projects. So we welcome him and we're very, very happy to have him here. We also welcome all of our students who are um, receiving the awards and, and thank them and their guests uh, for joining us. So please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Grievison. Dr. Chris Grievison joined DeVry University in 1981 as a faculty member in the general education department. From 1983 to 1993, he served as academic dean for general education. He returned to the faculty in 1993 as a senior professor, teaching courses in business, statistics, economics, marketing, and management. In 2004, Dr. Grievison was appointed Dean of Academic Affairs. In that role, Dr. Grievison worked with the faculty to introduce several new degree programs in business and healthcare technology. In 2007, Dr. Grievison became the third president of DeVry University in New Jersey. During his presidency, two new branch campuses, one in Paramus and one in Cherry Hill were established and the Keller MBA program was approved at all three locations. Dr. Grievison holds a Bachelor of Arts in Education, an MBA with a concentration in Financial Management, and a PhD in Organizational Strategy, all from Rutgers University. Thank you, Farouk, for that nice introduction. I think she said I started working here in 1881, was it? And that I was alive when the third president of the United States. Uh, yes, I'm old, I've been here for a long time. And uh, how exciting is it to celebrate the fourth anniversary of our Keller MBA program in New Jersey? And I, I can think back far enough to when uh, no degrees were offered in New Jersey and DeVry was the kind of trade school that you see uh, pictured on that table in those old black and white uh, shots and there were just electronics programs and we've come so so far uh, i can remember a question that was posed to me by uh, the new jersey commission of higher education meeting when we were having the cfa program approved and the question was uh, you know what do you know about graduate education and uh, Gosh, you could, you could go on and on about that. And why, why is it different from undergraduate education? You don't get good answers from Google, I've discovered, but so you have to kind of reach into the depths of your heart and come up with your own answer. I, I once talked to a friend who spent his life in, in academia, and he said uh, something that stuck with me. He said, you know, when you, when you pursue a bachelor's degree, you, you ask the question, what? You're asked the question, what? You have to know what? But once you set foot into graduate school at the master's or doctoral level, you start asking a lot about the hows and the whys and uh, of the what. And the other thing that, that strikes me when that question was posed to me is, yes, in the bachelor's program in business, we are preparing students for entry-level jobs so that they are able to add value to companies right away and hopefully be promoted. At the MBA level, there's an assumption that you're going to lead. So the perspective in the classroom is very, very different. I want to just say one final thing before I turn the mic over to, uh, to Dean Kanopka, and that is a tribute to Dean Farouk Aramani and to our faculty in the College of Business. When we accepted this program four years ago, it would have been very easy for Farouk and her uh, excellent team of faculty to do bare minimum, which would have been teach the courses, right? 
just teach the courses and then the students will graduate and have an MBA program. But they didn't do anything of the kind. They didn't do anything at all like that. They saw the MBA not as an end, but as a beginning. And it was a springboard to creating a new culture here, and a new institution here, uh, a new academic community. One that involves not only students and faculty, but outside organizations, companies, not-for-profits, academic institutions. And, and we are blessed here at DeVry. I'm looking at our, our keynote speaker and others. I'm thinking of our, our national executive speaker series, and we're, we're privileged to have uh, an individual who presented at that. And we just have such a wonderful and growing network of corporate leaders, organizational leaders, who have helped to develop this wonderful co-curricular life here that Faru and her team of faculty continue to build. I am so proud of this MBA program. It, it exceeds my wildest dreams. Uh, the fact that we have an MBA exceeds my wildest dreams from starting here in 1980, 1881. But um, to, to look at what has happened in four short years and to think about what the next four years of this graduate program will be like is just, it, it blows my mind. And I, I'm just so thankful to our corporate partners and, and to Furu and our faculty for, for what they've done. So uh, let me turn the microphone, presidents turn microphones over very reluctantly. We like to talk. That's why we're presidents. Uh, Joe Kanapka is our Dean of Academic Affairs. He uh, has a long and illustrious history. He was a telecommunications professor here. He was a department chair here of faculty, became the IT director went to UMDNJ and became their IT director and then came back to us as Dean of Academic Affairs. Several master's degrees, um, very close, probably within a year of defending a PhD in organizational management. So uh, I'm very proud and privileged to turn the microphone over to my friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Joe Kanaka. Thank you for those kind words. Um, I just want to tell a, a quick story about a meeting we just came from. Um, and, and what we do at DeVry is once, probably twice, maybe three times a year, we get together with different people from industry to talk about our programs at both the undergraduate and the graduate level. Um, and it's just, it, it's a refreshing time, I think, for us to, to understand that what we're doing with our students really is making a difference. To, to different organizations, whether it's a for-profit organization or whether it's a non-profit organization. And I think as Chris said, it's, it's a real testament. We, we talked about leadership and the different things that we, we may want to incorporate into our curriculum. But as I was looking out, out at the room and thinking about the event for tonight, there's a lot of leadership in that room and it all starts with, with Dean Garamani. Um, she, she's done a wonderful job with the, with the MBA program. She always puts together a, a wonderful Keller anniversary event with, the, with a great keynote speaker. So really, I'm just here to, to thank her for all the hard work and thank the, the faculty who participated as well. And when you talk about leadership and you look around the room and you look at, at how hard everyone is working to really make the bride a better place and to continue to develop and continuously improve what we do here, it's just a great feeling that, get, that it's, it's given to me. So with that said, um, now it's my turn to turn the microphone over to uh, Professor, and actually I should say Dr. Mike Faulkner, who is going to introduce our, our keynote speaker, right? <laughs> Thanks very much. Let me extend my uh, gratitude and welcome to all of you tonight. Many of you I've had in class and you're still alive, so that's a testament to your strength and uh, encourage uh, devotion to you know, extended punishment. Uh, our keynote speaker tonight, Frank Wyckoff, is founder and president of the Wyckoff Group. And Frank is a serial entrepreneur, and as he reminds me, that's not someone who continues open boxes of cereal. He's an investor in small businesses. The Wyckoff Group is a family of companies which includes a national marketing company, a multinational employment staffing firm, and a commercial real estate holding company. Now, you know when you have become a successful person when this happens. 
Craig said, why don't you come down to our office? So I said, okay, give me some directions. So he gave me some vague directions. And I said, well, that leads me up to the street that your building is on. But what's the name of the street? He said, oh, you'll know. So I come down the parkway, make the turn, and there's the building, because I recognize the description of it. And what street is it on? Wyckoff Street. <laughs> So that's when you know you're successful. And you know, beyond that, he, this is a man who lives in a lighthouse. So you know, that's the signs of real success. He currently serves as chairman on the board of directors for the New Jersey Manufacturers Extension Program, a nonprofit consulting firm that uh, de has uh, developed to support the growth and profitability of New Jersey manufacturers. And he's an accomplished staffing and career professional who's built and managed award-winning company and staffing offices and has been responsible for developing programs that have added 50,000 jobs to the American economy over the course of his career. He served 10 terms as president of the Franchise Advisory Board of Directors. He's a former host of New Jersey 12 television show, Job Connection. He's the um, a former radio program host, Job Changes. He's been published and quoted and seen on many of the New York and New Jersey electronic and print media outlets. In his role in these areas, he's been, of course, an entrepreneur, a mentor, a coach, an advisor. He's an excellent communicator, and I'm proud to say a friend. He's also a very, very good Western literature expert, so he's liable to quote Poe and Thoreau and Lawrence. So it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Frank Weichel. Right? <laughs> this is going to be such a letdown. <laughs> and, and that whole thing about turning over the mic. First, thank you very much for inviting me to celebrate the, your fourth anniversary. Uh, I'm especially fond of the Keller School, as you can tell from some of the remarks. I've been here a couple of times. I don't remember what I've said to you before, so I may be repeating myself. But what I love about this management program is that, for me, as a layperson, not an academic, for me, our secondary education, our undergrad education, always, it seemed to me, was designed around teaching us how to think. At the graduate level, though, now we're starting to really develop a direction for our lives, and we've got a set of, uh, we've got information and knowledge and tools that we need in order to begin our journey in real life to start to carve out a career. I love the saying when I came down the hall and I saw that to start your career or to advance the career you're already in, that's practical, that's real. And that's one of the reasons that I uh, love the great work that the that terrific administrators and faculty are doing here at Congress. Thank you again for inviting me. Um, when Farouk called me and asked me to uh, speak, I was of course honored and I appreciated it. I was happy that my uh, calendar allowed me to uh, come tonight, so I appreciate that. But then after a while, as we started to get closer to the date, I started to wonder, what in the world am I gonna talk about? I have no idea what these people are gonna be interested in hearing or what might be helpful. And, and I thought about it for a while and I kind of started thinking like I was back in school again and some professor had just asked me to write a scintillating paper on Beowulf or something. I had no idea what the hell I was going to say. Uh, so I, as I thought about it, I said, you know, if I were in your position, and maybe at the beginning or at the front end of my career, what would be helpful to me? And for me, I thought, I'm going to do a little something that I've never done before, and that is, I'm going to share my personal journey uh, in entrepreneurship. Uh, to become whatever version of entrepreneur you decide I am. I don't know that uh, I can't ever meet the very nice things that Michael said about me, and many of them, you know, he's the victim of hyperbole, we know that about his generation. So we're going to try to live up to at least some of what he said. But I, I uh, do want to begin with talking a little bit about my journey because I thought uh, just a realistic and practical approach to what my experience has been might be helpful. Um, I started in a very blue-collar town. Uh, my dad was a factory worker. 
um, we had an inelegant life. I mean, for the first uh, portion of my life, my favorite seafood was saltwater taffy. So I did not have, you know, one of those upbringings where I was expected. Um, the same one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can take this back. <laughs> because I'm confused already. My life has been in staring. Um, I was a boy of about 10 years of age, uh, kind of untamed by a summer sun one year, and, and uh, left the dusty baseball game, and decided to ride my bike down to Tom's Corner Store. And uh, on the way there, I decided I was going to spend my last dime on a cream sickle and a bottle of coke. Now you know this was many seasons ago, it was 10 cents for a cream sickle and a bottle of coke. But that's what it was. And um, I got there, and as I got there, I had this little trip where I would jump off my bike just before I knew it was going to stop, and I could watch it kind of coast to land, and I would love looking at the streamers on the handlebars, and in those days, we had baseball ticket cards that were close pinned to our spokes, so it sounded like a motorcycle bus, you know? And I had Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle and Duke Snyder on my baseball cards, and I watched it kind of coast into the window, and it propped up against the side window of Tom's Deli. And uh, I walked inside, and it was such an old place, I immediately heard the floorboards creaking and groaning as I started to make my way to the ice cream box. So when, out of the corner of my eye, I caught something, and I looked up and I saw the jars and the boxes and the cans on the shelves. It was like a matrix moment for me. I had this computer vision where I did a 180 scan of the store, and I went from the ice box where the soda was in bottles in, in ice, it wasn't like in a machine like it is today, that ice box to the candy counter to the counter where he had the cigar box. Tom had a cigar box where he kept his money. It was high finance in those days. And, and then he had the deli counter and I could still see the room over in the corner. And as I scanned it, I, I kind of stopped dead in my tracks and I was in all of this, trying to take it all in. And I looked over at the old man behind the counter where a dirty white apron was hiding that big belly of his. And I said, hey Tom, you own all this stuff? He said, yep, and the bills had come with me, and my dream was born. No longer was it a problem for me to have my mom drag me out shopping, because it was another chance for me to get a look at another store and see another business and try to figure it out. And my dad, who used to beat me up to try to help him fix the car, because as a factory worker, we weren't going to take it to someone to fix it. But every once in a while, he had to drive to the junkyard for a part. And I remember saying to myself, how do you make money out of junk cars and parts? I found out later on the owner of the junkyard on half the real estate in town, so they did pretty good. Anyway, I uh, I then followed that with a brief stint in uh, in college, where I hopefully learned to think a little bit, and uh, corporate America followed to kind of fast forward. Um, corporate America, I figured for me, was an opportunity for me to build my bankroll so that I could go off on my own. So I figured I would work in corporate America, make some money, put it away, and and then <laughs> put it away, and then be able to invest, start making investments, and go off and become an entrepreneur. So long days and late nights of work filled my life. But I ended up an executive with a mid-six-figure salary. Unfortunately, that became a fraction of a salary after I suffered my divorce and uh, <laughs> left that money to somebody else. Um, but good fortune smiled on me, and eight years later, I met and married my wife. And uh, she decided, she thought, after hearing my dreams, as many young couples talk about, she heard about my dream of wanting to be an entrepreneur, and she said, I've got an idea. Why don't we both quit our jobs, we'll leave corporate America, and we'll fund, we'll buy a business, and you can be an entrepreneur. I said, well, I really had an idea where one of us would have a job. <laughs> but, that didn't seem to be in the cards. And she said, no, we're all in or we're not in. So I said, okay. So we were all in. So we left corporate America, and I went out, and I found a staffing agency that I could buy, a franchise. A franchise staffing agency. And I bought a franchise staffing agency for two reasons. Number one, because it was getting people jobs. And I wanted to do something more meaningful than work with dial tone, which is what I did at eight. And I thought that it was important to find something that I could love and embrace. 
And I decided to buy a franchise because I said, well, not having the benefit of Keller or a school like that as a, in a graduate degree, I wasn't sure of my ability to manage a small business and run a business. So I decided that a franchise was a good opportunity because they came to me with a secure business model that was successful. And it was kind of like allowed me to put one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat. And I kind of felt like I had a safety net for my investment. I went to the training program and did a good job of teaching me about the staffing business. The second reason I wanted to buy a service business was because, frank, frankly, that's all I could afford. Because a service business is a lot cheaper, a lot less expensive than a manufacturing facility. Not only would it cost more money to buy those machines that made stuff, and the high-tech pieces of them, but the other problem I faced was somebody who had not a lot of funds. I looked at it and said, as technology changes and our culture changes, those machines were all going to have to be modified and changed. And I didn't have the money to keep up with technology. So I figured a service business took the technical piece out of it for me and allowed me to work with human nature in the service business. So that worked for me. My idea was I would do the service business, gather the money that I didn't make in corporate America, save the money, and use that for my investments. Well, it worked out pretty good. Uh, we started to build the office. We bought it, used our down payment, use it to make a down payment for half of the cost of the service business. And we said to the previous owner, tell you what, we'll give you the rest of it in six months out of the profits of the business. We didn't know how hard it would be to make profits in a new business. But when we bought the business, there were five people in the company, a receptionist and four recruiters. The first week we were there, the receptionist came and told us she had to leave because her brother-in-law was going in the carpet business and she was going to be his receptionist. So, I sat down with each of the recruiters individually and I said, listen, I just want you to know that I'm going to do whatever it takes to help you meet your goals and dreams and to help you be successful professionally and personally. Three of them looked at me and said, well, you know, I really don't have any goals. Sharon gave me this job because she gave me a lot of time off to travel with my husband. So they were gone. So now we were left with one person who was the rainmaker on this big franchise that I bought, $180,000 in sales. The rainmaker did $100,000 a year. I brought her in. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help you be successful and to help you meet all your goals professionally and personally, whatever it takes. And I threw myself in 100% for it. And she looked at me and said, I have to tell you, Frank, I'm pregnant. She said, the other thing I have to tell you is that $100,000 that I brought in, $75,000 of it was Sharon's husband's company. I said, oh boy, I learned a little lesson about due diligence at this point. So my wife and I sat down and we said, certainly we sat down in an empty office. And we said, well, what are we gonna do? This is what we have. And we owe this guy another six months worth of down payment. The rest is to pay off the business. So we had a decision. And we decided that we were going to suck it up and build a business. And that's what we did. We went out and hired some people, and uh, my wife did jobs that she hated. <clears throat> my wife did a job as a recruiter. And my wife it does not like talking to people on the phone. She's not assertive, but she did this for us. And I did every job in that company. I was the receptionist, I was the salesperson, I was the bookkeeper, did everything. And it turned out pretty good. We ended up with 11 offices in about six different states and uh, had a very successful business. One of the things we learned as we started to make money, we learned that uh, there was no marketing being done for any staffing company. So we looked at that as an opportunity and we said, you know, why don't we create a marketing company? Because I've got a marketing background and we have this staffing experience and expertise. Let's put it together and do it. So I picked up the phone and I called the CEO and the COO of uh, the Stanford franchise. And I said, if I put this together with this company, what do you say I get the business from your franchise company? It's a million dollar account. He said, sounds good, Frank, do it. I did it. It cost me about 50,000 to get it started up. Put it together, flew everybody out to Dallas, gave a presentation unanimously. This is phenomenal, we're gonna do it. And they signed everybody up. Two weeks later, the chairman of the board called up and said, hey, Frank, I'm really reluctant for political reasons to uh, give a franchisee a contract this big. So I'm afraid I'm not to pull the contract. So we said, okay, another little setback. We'll spin the company off and do something separate. That became grassroots market. 
Now we have a wonderful portfolio of clients that are a broad cross-section of small businesses up through and including uh, the federal government, the National Institute of Science and Technology, where we support all of the MVP pro programs nationally. So that company worked out pretty good. At the same time, we decided to turn out of the franchise business and go out independently, and that became the work. And that now is our staffing company outside of this franchise business. And I began dabbling in commercial real estate. I bought my first building in Lakewood, New Jersey for $180,000. It was a hovel, but it was located at the Welcome to Lakewood sign, and it was the, uh, the gateway building for the town of Lakewood. And I was enthusiastic about it, but it really needed so much work. And I had no money to speak of. So I went to uh, Bob Singer, who at the time was a state senator, I think he still is, for that area. And I sold him on the idea that as a gateway building, the state should help finance the rehabilitation of that building. Wonderful Bob. Bob's a great guy. Gave me $75,000 as a grant. I renovated the building and sold it. Years later, or 10 times the problem. So that was kind of the beginning of the commercial business. My plan was, as I build businesses, I would buy buildings and become my own tenant, thereby precluding the idea that I'm likely to get stiff, which we do in the business world, get stiff. Anyway, so at this point now, we've got the staffing company, we've got the marketing company, we've got some commercial real estate, and we've got some other investments. Along the way, some failures took place, some nice failures, a recycling investment, a recycling company. Went belly up. Why? Politics of Philadelphia. I should have known that. We had no connections in Philadelphia. We lost our heads and lost our business. So that went bad. We had a furniture company. I had these two artists who were terrifically talented, young people. And they took antique furniture and painted these bold, beautiful patterns. Really just incredible artists. And uh, we turned that around for about three years. We worked for that. Very successful, a lot of celebrity clients, uh, Pearl Jam manager, Bon Jovi, things like that. A lot of fun, but I had uh, entered into negotiations with a designer in New York to buy the business, and about 30 days before that sale was to take place, had quadrupled my investment. The designer was delivering, coming back from a delivery of furniture, and ran his van into a bridge abutment on the parkway. Was airlifted to the hospital, never to return. So, that was happening. So there was a number of failures along the way. Uh, you know, the challenges of uh, business uh, as you're getting started up uh, continue to uh, raise their heads every day. But you know, without those challenges, it's not nearly as much fun. Uh, it's nice to go smooth for a while. You've got to have some turbulence. But look at the challenges that we're faced with today. There's the uncertain economy. There's, dare I say it, healthcare, Obamacare. The impact on business I don't know how many of you are actually involved in, actively involved in business today, but the impact on business for Obamacare is going to be tremendous. I mean, I've got people in my company whose insurance rates are going to be three and four times the amount. So we're trying to find ways to make sure that everybody can work through this. So it's had a significant impact on business. And I'm not talking about the social aspect of it, I'm just talking about the financial aspect. Um, the regulations that we have to deal with, the taxes, federal and state taxes, are overwhelming and continuing to grow. Government intrusion continues to exacerbate things. And uh, one of the key things that we deal with as a challenge as a, as a businessman is the workforce. Um, there's two issues with the workforce. There's a tremendous skills gap right now in the workforce. Now, when you look at what technology has brought to the business community, it's been so wonderful on so many levels. But every single survey that we've taken over the last five years, we've identified this gap where manufacturers and their related companies, people with these kinds of high tech positions, cannot find people for those jobs that rest between the engineering level and the blue collar worker level. There's people really not trained to understand how to run these very technical uh, computers and machines. Uh, and that's left a real gap for us. And so we don't have people to fill those jobs. Now, the other challenge to the workforce is just building your own company and finding people to hire. It's an art, not a science. And uh, you know the talent that you have in your company is the difference often between success and failure in that company. It doesn't matter how good your idea or your product is. It goes by the talent that you have. But the number one thing that I think I've found as the challenge 
to being in business today and to being an entrepreneur. The number one challenge for each of us, and I dare say each of you, is going to be nothing prepares you, not anything you learn here, not anything you learn in, in life, nothing for, prepares you for having to meet your payroll for the first time. Having to meet a paycheck every payday, nothing prepares you for the emotional burden that that can play on you. Trying to struggle to meet you. Any a time, that paycheck comes in, that, that invoice was paid by a client. We were struggling saying, how are we gonna meet payroll? Our bank account was empty, payroll was up, and I can still remember it like it was yesterday. I opened the mail the day before payday, and there was a $7,000 check there from a client. And my wife and I went in the kitchen, closed the door, and hugged each other and said, we made payroll, we made payroll. And that's the life of a businessman. That's what it takes to go through. It's great fun when you look back on it. It's like saying when my wife and I first got got married, we lived in Boston for a short while, and we didn't, couldn't afford a refrigerator, and we had our milk out on the roof of the roof of the apartment. We slept on a box spring on the floor, and you know, we look at those now very fondly, we look back on those days, but I have to tell you, I don't want to go back and do it again. <laughs> so what's it take to meet these challenges? Well, I'm not going to bore you with that conversation about knowledge. And I'm not going to bore you with passion and work ethic. Everybody knows it's hard. We're kind of loud. Steve Jobs said it best. He said, you know, being an entrepreneur is long, hard work. You must persevere. Same people quit. And I think that really says it all. But I'm not going to bother you too much with that. I want to talk about three other things quickly. Innovation, ethics, and action. I'm not talking about traditional innovation where you're talking about new technology, new products, new innovations. Those, th those are sometimes big ideas. Those are Bill Gates, Steve Jobs ideas. Those happen, those are generational ideas. They're big. I'm talking about what I call derivative things. I'm talking about taking your business and the line of business that you're in and creating new applications, new products, new opportunities that are derived from the business you're already in and creating new revenue streams for your business. It's the door frame manufacturer in Newark who sat down one day with his team and realized they could adjust their machines and turn it into a window frame manufacturing company also and created a new revenue stream for his business. It's the great story about the uh, soap manufacturer in China who got word back from his uh, customers that too many of the boxes were being sent out and received empty. And so he sat down, it was a multi-billion dollar conglomerate. They sat down with a team of engineers. You know what engineers are, right? <laughs> An engineer is, uh, well, let me tell it this way. There's a priest, a drunk, and an engineer. And they're all got to go through the guillotine. And the priest is first. And they, the guy on the guillotine says to him, you know, how do you want to be buried? And he said, I want to go face up so I can face God. So they put him face up on the guillotine. And the guillotine comes down, and it stops an inch from his neck. And they see that as a divine uh, message. And they let the priest go. And the drunk is next, and they say, how do you want to be buried? He said, I want to be buried face up too, figuring to have the same fate maybe as the priest. And he, they lay him down on his back face up, and the guillotine comes down and stops an inch from his neck. And they let him go too, divine intervention. The engineer comes up and says, okay, how do you want to be buried? He says, I want to be buried face up too. And he lays down there, and the guillotine is above, and he says, hey, wait, I see the problem. <laughs> but so these engineers get together and they say, well, the boxes are ended up, ended up empty. How can we fix that? And they come up with this new design of an x-ray machine. This is a true story, an x-ray machine. And they put this x-ray machine and it x-rays the boxes. And when, is, when the box is empty or near empty, there's four more people on the assembly line they had and they take the box off the assembly line. Solve the problem, their customers are happy. Fast forward to the soap manufacturer in Dayton, New Jersey, who had the same problem, but it was a small factory. And the president of the soap manufacturing company is down on the line talking to his team, saying, we're getting these complaints about empty soap boxes. And I know that they had this problem in China, and they had this machine, but it cost like $130,000, and there's four more people added to the assembly line. They don't put us out of business. What are we gonna do? Well, one of the material handlers overheard them talking. He said, whoa, yo, New Jersey, right? Yo, you got a problem with empty boxes? I said, yeah, yeah, so I'll handle that, leave it with me. 
And they kind of dismissed him and went on talking. What are we going to do about this problem? In the meantime, he runs over and he unplugs an electric industrial fan. And he goes over and he takes it and he sets it up on the conveyor belt, plugs it in, adjusts the speed, blows it at the conveyor line. As the boxes are going down, the empty ones blow up. <laughs> Innovative thing. Innovative thing. Frank Zappa had a great, great quote. For those of you who are too young to know who Frank Zappa was, he was a great old rock and roll. And he said, all the great music was already written by old guys in wigs and stuff. Listen, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff existing out there in the world, but it's such fertile territory for you to make a of business happen. So look at it that way. There's a lot of room for innovation, and it's really an important part of your, your role as an entrepreneur. Ethics. I've talked about this the last couple of times I've been here. I don't want to be repetitive, but it's such an important part of it. Listen, it takes you 20 years to build your reputation and five minutes to destroy it. The people in your company need to know that they're proud of the people they work with. They're proud of the choices you as their leader make. It's important that you know. I believe that as you get older, you start to realize that there's less and less gray in life. Life is about black and white choices. You know what's right. You know the right answer. It may not be on the surface immediately the most financially rewarding or beneficial for your company. But you know what the right thing is. And that's the way you need to build your business. Because ethics is important. I, uh, I think as part of ethics, there's also mistakes that you can make. And I'm going to kind of divert here from common understanding, I think. Because I think there's mistakes that you learn from, but there's also mistakes that you need to make and that it's okay to repeat. Let me a quick example. I, I had a client in the staffing business who uh, owed us a bit of money. And uh, I went out to meet him and I extended his line of credit because during the course of our conversation he told me he was a Vietnam War veteran. And I went to college in the 60s and while he was fighting a war, I was drinking beer and chasing women. Well, actually, girls. And and uh, so I felt guilty about that. And I said, you know, it's the right thing to do. I'm going to extend this guy's credit. And it cost me $350,000. And that's a mistake I won't repeat. That's a mistake I learned. But at the same time, I had a dear friend of mine when I was in corporate America who mentored me. In corporate America, it's very difficult to find somebody to treat you like a person, like a man or a woman. Oftentimes you're looked at as an asset. I don't mean to disparage everybody, but that's the culture. It's a very competitive culture. But this man treated me like a man. And he gave me respect. And he mentored me. And he taught me. And as a result of that, my future and my career collaborated. And I appreciate it. Because he talked to me with dignity and respect. And I learned a lot. So he forever had my loyalty. Well, I left corporate America. And he continued. But about 20 years ago, he left. And he was going to be an entrepreneur. And he had, by this time, he had advanced to the third highest ranking officer in a Fortune 25 company. Powerful guy, great financial assets and resources. Leaves corporate America to be an entrepreneur. And 20 years later, let's suffice it that to say that my friend George went through all of his money because he had nothing but failure after failure. I had invested in some of George's projects just because I wanted to make him feel good about it. But I told my wife at the time I invested in it that it was money not well spent. George came to me in financial despair a few months ago and said he had one last shot at it. He was going to subcontract for a company who had a deal with the state. He won't name the state. And <clears throat> And he needed some help. He needed to put together a call center with 100 people in it. And he needed to make sure that that call center people could get paid and could be funded, but he didn't have the money for it. But he showed me the contracts. So we created a deal, and I agreed to make the investment. But it had to be done at paper-thin margins for him to make money on it. And so I did that. But the way it was structured was that if he didn't pay in 15 days, I would start losing money. Well, the state and the primary contractor had a falling out. And fast forward, I lost $300,000. I'll make that mistake again. I'll do it tomorrow. 
because there are just some things more important. The ethics of how you lead your life and the choices you make to make, whatever's right for you, is important. Now listen, I believe that it's wonderful to want to give back to the community and to want to be good and do all those things. But I'm not the Jerry Lewis telephone. I'm here to make money too. But I think that you have to balance that in your life. And the last uh, thing I want to speak about is action. You know, General Patton said it right. A good plan executed violently today is better than a great plan executed next week. And I like the word violently because it calls for action. Listen, how many people end up with great ideas, great opportunities, and they sit there and they're, they're just a little too tentative? They're afraid to pull the trigger. When, a, when something shouts at you, trust yourself. Take a big swing. Take a swallow and take a swing and believe in it. It's what matters. It's what makes the difference for you. And it's what really creates job satisfaction for an entrepreneur. I'm going to have you some final thoughts now, and you're going to have to bear with me, because as an old English major, I uh, have too many literary references that I can't go on, on the story. And, and the one that you're going to have to bear with today is a quote from Shakespeare's Tempest. And it's Prospero's speech, and it's a short one. It's just a summary of it. But I'm going to read it because I want it to be right. Our rebels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air into thin air, an ending. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Look, I'm not trying to do nothing dramatic, but everybody in this room already knows there's no second acts. We all know about how we can be in touch with our mortality, and this is a great show. And let me tell you, there are some statistics that challenge you. Six, 50 to 70% of all new businesses, all new businesses within 18 months fail, fail. 50 to 70 percent. So what? I hear 30 to 50 percent succeed. Who doesn't want to be in the top third of the class? Can't be a doctor. Can't be a doctor. Small business accounts for 66 percent of all net new jobs since the 70s. In the 1990s, big business lost four million jobs. Small business gained 8 million jobs. In 2006, there were 670,000 new businesses created. 670,000 new businesses in 2006 created 3.5 million jobs for people. 3.5 million, five jobs for every new business. In 2010, the economy softened. They created 500,000 jobs, 500,000 new companies, 2.5 million jobs. Five jobs. Everywhere. This is the world you're going to live in. This is who you are. This is the impact that you can have on the rest of the world. I believe the rest of the world needs people like us. I believe it because of the impact we can have. I think you have to be determined to live beyond yourself because the impact you're going to have is going to be more than you just making a lot of money. 85 percent of the millionaires today are self-made. Self-made. But the impact goes beyond just your money and your bank account. There's challenges to be had and challenges to be met. But like Jimmy Valdano said a long time ago, don't give up. Don't ever give up. It's just too damn important to all of us. Thank you. If, if, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer whatever they are. Excellent. I had an oil painting like this just at home one time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Well, we want to really thank you for uh, sharing the sphere of entrepreneurship with uh, all of the, uh, the DeVry University and Keller Graduate School of Management community, and um, to show our appreciation and gratitude for what you've done for us, and we'll continue to be our partner. Um, Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Frank. And um, now we would like to um, present the student awards. Uh, we have several awards tonight. We're going to start with the leadership award. Uh, with the Academic Performance Award, actually, and um, uh, Dr. John Weber will be presenting. If all of the faculty could please join us on the stage, and um, uh, President Grievison, as well as uh, Dean Kanapka, to congratulate the uh, awardees as they come up. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to present the Academic Achievement Award to a very deserving student this year. I've had the pleasure of having this student in class about a year ago. During that class, I found that this student was not only intelligent, but hardworking, diligent, and very humble. Her professors also agree, which is evidenced by their comments, which I'm going to repeat. One professor commented that she is smart, hardworking, and very personable. A fellow faculty member also comment, commented that she has the five tools of a great business player. High skill analytics, psychological flexibility, communication savvy, humble but forceful energy, and finally, good time to decision skills. So I am very pleased to present the 2014 Academic Achievement Award to Sylvia Miller. I'm also pleased to present the Leadership Award this, this evening. Uh, we have a notable student leader, uh, a, a student here that was a notable leader during her stay here at DeVry. She was an active member and officer of the Sigma, uh, Sigma Beta Delta Honor Fraternity. She was also selected to be a student coordinator and presenter at the New Jersey Entrepreneurship Summit. She has helped to lead several student initiatives for the college. She has also demonstrated her leadership in the classroom. During the MBA capstone class, she led her team through an extreme adversity to produce perhaps one of the best business plans in the class. She did this through service leadership by putting her teammates first and leading with her heart. In the end, she has earned the respect of her classmates and the faculty. I'm very pleased to present this award to Ms. Sadia Akhtar. And at this time, I'm very pleased to present Professor Tim Dempsey, who will present the next award. Good evening, everyone. The uh, recipient of the service award was highly recommended by several of our faculty members. And I would just like to read one of those recommendations as an indication of why he's receiving the award. He is the epitome of service to the college and the university. He has willingly helped with photographing and videotaping our events on his own time and using his own resources. I've known him as a solid undergraduate and graduate student, but his photos are truly beautiful, only matched by his attitude towards service. And uh, with that recommendation, I would like to present the service award to Hamja Jalomi Ba. to introduce Dr. Deborah Hellman to present another of our awards. Hello, um, I'd like to, I'm going to be presenting the Perseverance Award. Um, this is uh, given to a student that has demonstrated outstanding academic performance um, in the face of some quite significant um, challenges. 
And so um, we um, particularly want to acknowledge this, this particular student has worked very hard through all of his courses, but has really um, stood out in the way that he approached um, his, entrepreneur, uh, his, I think it's his internship course. Um, so he, he you know, went through the course obviously successfully, but continued to work on that subsequently in his own time. And um, he, uh, as a result, has uh, produced some very good work as a, as a result of, of working in conjunction with uh, Professor Strand on web analytic tools. Um, and this, uh, this work is so successful that it's actually going to be presented at the NEDSI conference in Philadelphia in the spring. So I'd like you all to uh, congratulate Leos um, Belos. Um, <laughs> Pleasure to uh, uh, present the Innovation and the Impact Award. And Mr. Wyckoff, you might have an investment here, so. Uh, a great team. Well, they're innovative, the way you find innovation with uh, the, the Frank Zappa quote. Uh, they are definitely taking ideas that are already out there and uh, putting them into practice. Uh, the, uh, this team, uh, they produced a business plan uh, in their capstone course for the MBA. And the business plan was for uh, a company called Healthy Face, Healthy Face, right? I'm sure you're right. Healthy Face Food Truck at Rutgers University. And it made a lot of sense. My son goes to Rutgers and I know what he eats. And he likes the grease trucks. So there's the convenience of that. So this team's idea was that why don't we have, have to go to grease trucks, but with something that gives the students an opportunity to get something that's good for them. Uh, they based it on research that Rutgers had already done on the demand for a healthy food on campus. Uh, inform, uh, informing the plan itself, uh, they actually did a lot of research. They spent hours, from what I could see, unless they were just making stories about this, but they spent hours actually observing the businesses that were already there so that they could get an idea of what the volume of traffic was. Uh, they also did measurements on how long it took to serve a customer. I think initially we started off thinking we could serve 10,000 a day, uh, but we came pretty quick. Uh, noticeable that you couldn't serve, what was it, under a minute? Yeah, something like that. So they went through a lot of uh, detailed uh, uh, research and analysis to come up with the plan that they did. Uh, like I mentioned, the hard work was evident uh, all the way uh, all the way through the course. And one thing about this team was it's not like they just kind of turned it up at the end. Uh, they kept going all the way through. And uh, uh, the other thing I liked was their team leader, George, he always brought food. <laughs> and it really helped when on day one he came in with donuts and coffee. Okay? And for the whole class. And on the last day, they brought food from the food truck, healthy food, so it's, re it's really great. So anyway, I'd like to uh, present uh, the award to uh, the team. The team consists of George Sanchez, Sylvia Villa, Kimberly Polda, and Mohamed El Hakim. Please come on up. Congratulations to all of the award recipients. The process was very difficult because we had a lot of really great candidates and nominees, but what was very interesting was um, 
while the nomination process was a blind nomination process, a lot of the same students did get nominated, which was a uh, uh, fantastic um, testament to uh, the recipients of the awards. At this time, we would like to recognize a member of our distinguished faculty for exceptional achievement and leadership in carrying the entrepreneurial spirit into his teaching, setting an extraordinary example for aspiring students, dedicated faculty, staff, and alumni. Please join me in congratulating Professor Tim Dempsey as the recipient of this award. contributions to the BSBA program in his role as department chair of the BSBA program. He serves as a mentor to adjunct to visiting professors and has been instrumental in helping with the ACBSB accreditation and New Jersey State relicensure processes. Um, he recently overhauled the undergraduate senior project course so that it had more opportunities for our accounting students. The primary reason for this award is for the work he does on a regular basis to support faculty and students in the MBA capstone course. He does this extra work with passion and enthusiasm. He has developed an integrated set of spreadsheets for our students to use for developing their financial plans. This instrument has become an integral part of the MBA capstone course. Professor Dempsey provides seminars in the capstone course to explain its use to the students and continues to fine tune the instrument. Every semester, Professor Dempsey serves as a mentor for students who are developing financial and accounting plans in the MBA capstone course. While most mentors take on one to two teams in a session, Professor Dempsey does not seem to put a limit on how many teams he will mentor. In financial planning, based on feedback from some of the faculty and in the words of, of one of the faculty, Professor Strand, uh, financial plan planning is one of those courses, areas that require special expertise that most faculty teaching the capstone course need help with. Professor Dempsey's enthusiastic willingness to support in this area makes the job easier for his colleagues. And more importantly, gives students the expert advice they need. He, be he has become the go-to person for the financial aspects of the capstone course. The College of Business and Management and Keller faculty and I have been truly impressed by his effort, expertise, professionalism, and above all, his undying commitment to the success of all students and to the success of the, his colleagues. It is important to make note of how Professor Dempsey does all of this. He proactively offers help to his peers and students. His positive, humble attitude carries through in all the work that he does to provide world-class service to the students and his colleagues. Tim, you exemplify the DeVry University Teach Values, and we are proud to have you on our team. So this ends the formal part of uh, the event. We hope that you'll stay and um, network with each other, but I want to leave with, with one thought. Um, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow at 12.57 p.m. Tomorrow. Anyone know? You get to have a carrot if you know. <laughs> it's the moment of spring, the first moment of spring. And it's a very special <laughs> celebration for me. I'm an Iranian and our new year is at the time of spring. But there was a quote that I came across yesterday, and Professor Grievison talked about new beginnings, and um, each second you can be reborn. Each second there can be a new beginning. It is choice, it is your choice. And this is by Clearwater.
So, um, to new beginnings and happy spring.